Hi, Jarek the Father of the Patient Gamer here with another fantastic Patient Gamer pick. If you're like other RPG strategy gamers, you love Mountain Blade Warband, but you hate all the terrible, janky, outdated graphics and jump mechanics. Well, now there's a game that will update those graphics, add new features, and improve the jumping. Well, never mind on the last part. Allow me to introduce you to Mountain Blade 2, Blender Blorx, Tail World's next edition prequel to Mountain Blade Warband. Hoorah! We have upgraded sieges with overpowered equipment and buggy AI that make them ever more frustrating. New and improved combat that somehow seems to be even less responsive than its predecessor. And don't forget the tedious mind-numbing smithing mechanic that is a great way to induce vomiting. But hey, them graphics ladies and gentlemen. Banger Blord is looking mighty fine with its new coat of paint, yeah. And despite some of the annoyances implemented in this wondrous open world strategy RPG, there is still a lot to love. That's right, Blenny Blogs is just like family. You can't stand a lot of its qualities, but at the end of the day, you just can't bring yourself to kicking it out of the house. So take a seat and let's see how Banny Borgs compares to its predecessor, and if it's worth picking up in the year of our savior, 2024. <laughs> For those perhaps not familiar with the Mountain Blade series, boy are you missing out. If you're into RPGs in an open world setting with strategy mechanics that is. Mountain Blade is almost an entire genre in and of itself. There just isn't many if any other games that are quite like it. It's very unique in that regard and beloved most of all was Warband, standalone expansion to the original Mountain Blade. Warband was released in 2010 with a few DLCs released after, with the last being in 2014. 764 years later, we finally got Banner Blords, full released in 2022 after two years in early access. Following the development of Banner Snord, you find that it has come a long way over the years, albeit slowly. They have implemented many new features while attempting to improve on the ones already present and its sensual predecessor. Whether they succeeded in this improvement is up to the player, given that many have varying opinions on Blanner Glord. But who cares about them? You're here watching my video, so I'm going to give you my humbly awesome opinion. But for starters, for those who aren't familiar with Mountain Blade, what does the gameplay entail? Open world strategy RPG could be interpreted to be many a things after all. Well, in Mountain Blade Branner Nords, you start by creating and controlling a character that will be your main dude. You build them how you wish and then unleash them into the overworld where you will find yourself in troubled times with an impoverished clan. You swiftly must build up a small force and begin carving your path into the realm of Calradia, the game's world and map. You will have to manage a growing party with companions you can choose to lead their own parties or govern any fiefs you may obtain, or just fight your way through enemy armies, bandits, and rebels alike. The strategy element comes on the overworld map where you move your party around from place to place finding things to do and people to fight. The combat is done in third or first person perspective in a battle arena allowing for some fun action-y times. Hmm. In combat, you can order your troops around directly, telling them to charge, flank, defend, set up different formations, etc. Or you can give command to assign captains from your companion pool and allow them to take control and do their own tactics. I find this to be the most effective and fun approach personally. I like to let my peeps do their thing while I ride around picking at the enemy's backline, disrupting their cavalry charge, or just taking out their lords. <laughs> As the game progresses, you find yourself doing various tasks for various peoples. This can be simple things like bringing a village noble some tools or transporting a herd of piggies to another town, or something more complex like finding a nobleman's daughter that's attempting to elope, or bringing a band of outlaw recruits for the local gang leader. This is one of many improvements that Bringer Gords has over Warband, the variety of quests you get from the various denizens of Calradia. There is generally a lot to do in that regard, if you enjoy the quest that is. My opinion here is very hit or miss. There are some quests that are fun to do and I enjoy repeating them, such as taking out poachers or army deserters or extorting villagers, or escorting a nobleman's caravan as it makes its way from town to town. Pretty fun. But then there are a plethora of quests that I find outright boring or simply infuriating if you're not prepared for them. One example is hunting brigands. This finds you tasked with taking out a number of bandits in the vicinity of a small village. Sounds easy, right? Well, sure, if you have a ton of horses in your party that allow you increased movement speed on the map, as well as a high level of the scouting trait on you or one of your companions in your party. If not, you're kind of bummed because there are often times these bandits are wildly faster than your party and will simply outrun you. Don't even get me started on the step bandits that all ride horses that leave you in the dust. Ugh. Another issue with this quest is that you have to be within certain range of the village. So if you chase the bandits, and you will chase the bandits, they will often just run out of the range from the village forcing you to try and herd them closer or kill them and not get credit for it in the quest. This is baffling to me and I don't understand the reasoning behind it. Why not just allow you to chase them until you defeat them and get credit for the quest? I don't know. Another quest that's a pain is taking out bandit hideouts. This seems fun in theory, but the hideouts are fairly large linear pathways that find you trudging along at a snail's pace taking out pockets of baddies while you make your way to the pushover in boss. This wouldn't be so bad if the hideout maps weren't littered with invisible walls and obstacles that force you on a specific path. Not fun, no siree. 
And lastly, you have smithing quests. As mentioned in the intro, Banger Dorg implemented a smithing crafting mechanic that is nothing short of irritating. Not only is it extremely tedious to have the right amount of resources in order to build a simple sword, but it has a cooldown mechanic that forces you to rest during the crafting period. So in order to build a, say, sword, you have to build the blade, the guard, the grip, and the pommel all separately. But in order to even get to the point of building those, you have to have specific types of iron, coal, and wood. You then have to craft some ingredients with those basic ones just to get to the point of being able to craft one of the components of the weapon. And you have to do this for every single one. Ugh. And as said before, you can only craft so many things before having to rest for quite some time in order to restore your exhaustion meter just so you can continue crafting some more. This is horrible and the first time I have ever added a mod to my first playthrough in a game that removes the exhaustion meter entirely. Sure, you can make copious amounts of gold working at this smithing mechanic, but I play games to have fun, not to have a second tedious job, and smithing in banner boards is without a doubt the worst mechanic in the game, in my opinion. Some people might like it, maybe you will, I think it's horrible. So when I get quests from gang leaders to make them a few daggers, I run from that shit like Henry Cavill running from Comic Con fanboys. I find it has zero redeeming qualities as a game mechanic unless you really like that type of crafting. If so, then hey, more power to ya. Each to their own, beauty is in the eye of the beholder, one man's diarrhea mucus ball is another man's milkshake. That sort of thing, yeah. But the beauty of Bandy Snords is that you don't have to do any of these quests if you so choose. A lot of them aren't even worth it in the mid to late game as the time investment isn't worth the payout, so you always have other options to do other things. For me, I greatly enjoy just going around the map hunting bandits, taking them prisoner, and selling them for ransom. This is what I did mostly in the early game, amassing quite a reputation and a decent amount of money, as well as building a sizable army that prepared me for the mid to late game, but more on that later. Another improvement they did over Warband that I really enjoy is the diplomacy and relationship side of things. They really went all out when it comes to being able to converse with the various NPCs in the game. You could do this in past iterations of Mountain Blade, mind you, but here they added a large pool of dialogue options, voice acting, and unique styles to each faction's culture. It makes the game feel much more immersive and alive, nah mean? However, there is another mechanic they implemented in this that I find really baffling. That is the persuasion skill check. There will be times when you have to persuade various NPCs to do something, be it stop poaching in a region, not elope and return to the parents, or when you're wooing someone, getting them to like you, you know? This is all fine and good, but the success is based off your skills, and they're loaded with copious amounts of RNG. I mean, they put critical failure states in this dialogue system. I got to the point where I was critically failing options over and over when I would have an 87% chance of success. Naturally, I just saved scum and reloaded over and over again to test it out for, you know, research purposes, <laughs> and it would still give me massive critical failures. And once you get a critical failure, you cannot continue on with the dialogue which requires two successes or one critical success, thus locking you out of any options of moving forward with that conversation. Why this is in the game, I have no idea. If you don't build to have some form of persuasion and conversation, you're completely screwed and just have to go with the forceful approach rather than the more fun, in my opinion, diplomatic approach. And I wouldn't mind this so much if it didn't have a critical failure state. I just don't see how this contributes to the fun of the player one bit. Having just regular percentages I can understand, but this isn't Dungeons and Dragons, this is Mountain Blade. So I find myself just saves coming anytime there's these dialogue checks because I have zero desire to attack someone just because I got unlucky on a 15% chance of a critical failure. Very odd design decision. And I know they had persuasion and warband and maybe this was going on behind the scenes but you wouldn't see it in your face so maybe it's less egregious there. I don't know, I just don't like it. Moving on, it's not all bad despite my complaints. There is a lot to love about Band Accords that pays decent homage to the greatness that is Warband. For one, the massive battles are a true pleasure to partake in. There's something very captivating about seeing your massive army that took you hours upon hours to build and upgrade, charging across a giant battlefield to clash with the enemy. Seeing all your boys and girls in shiny armor holding fancy weapons brings a tear to the eye and a stirring to the loins. Not to mention the elation of seeing all that green, mmm. Then you got some awesome corpse piles that puts a gnarly smile on one's face. And the battlefield maps are very diverse and fun as well, just like in Warband. Depending on where you are on the overworld map of Calradia, you may be fighting in snow, which will affect your movement speed, or forests that finds you having to dodge trees if you're on horseback, or some rocky valleys that allows little room to flank, but grants you some cover behind boulders. You also have some open fields or sandy dune maps that allow for just all-out warfare. It's great! And that's where I think Blammer Blobs shines. It's map and level design. They really went all out when it came to sprucing up the graphical fidelity and atmosphere of the various towns and villages. They even have a fancy new weather system with cool rain and storm mechanics. I mean, check out the lightning, woo! The big cities are all a spectacle to behold now too, each with their own unique design and style based on the culture they reside in. This was nothing new to Mountain Blade, mind you. Warband had similar diversity in their towns depending on the faction, 
But here they really filled up the areas, making them feel more alive with people walking around, more asset clutter, market vendors, soldiers and gangs and whatnot. It's pretty fun to just walk around and take it all in. Naturally, you can visit quest givers and merchants and artisans in person by simply pressing the handy alt button that shows key figures in the area, which also works on the battlefield too when you're trying to find where your and your enemy's troops are. But the great thing is, you don't have to go into town if you don't want to. You can simply access all the same people on the town's main page with a simple click. Hovering over each person will also give you some useful information on them, as well as the quests that they will be giving you. That way you can avoid the shitty ones without having to go through the whole process of talking to them. This is very well designed and was a bit of an annoyance in Warband where you had to manually go into each area and track down the quest giver. They really streamlined it in Banner Butts and it's just a nice quality of life improvement overall. Break down. And speaking of battlefields, how does the new and improved combat feel in this iteration? For those who don't know, Mountain Blade's combat is directional, so whichever way you move with the mouse or joystick, your character should take up their stance or position based on that direction for blocking or attacking. But, well, in all honesty, it might just be me, but I feel that Warband's combat felt a little bit more fluid and responsive. Amadorid's combat is perfectly serviceable, mind you, but it just seems far jankier to me. For instance, in Warband, which I was just playing before I played this, so I'm not speaking from nostalgic point of view here, when I aim in a specific direction, the character follows that direction pretty accurately. In Black Alakalakamore, it's almost a crapshoot. I will often do the same mouse movement to repeat the same directional attack for my character, only to have him go in a completely different direction. I might try to aim right, back to back, he aims high. Sometimes I will try to aim high, and he'll go left or right. This is at its worst on horseback. And there will be times when I completely whiff my attacks when I can physically see my weapon going through the enemy. Yet, if I'm within 300 feet of a tree or a rock or a wall, my weapon will somehow manage to hit that obstacle more times than my target, even though my target is right in front of me. Granted, that's expected in close quarters combat like during sieges, but when I'm out in an open battlefield, it doesn't make much sense. But despite all that, the combat is still very enjoyable and I find myself engaging in it whenever I can. I will still plow through enemies like crazy with my balance romp, 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 for five fee. No sweat. I just wish my character would obey my commands more rather than fighting me tooth and nail on which direction I wish to strike. Like Warband, a big part of combat is sieges. Hammercord took sieges and, well, beefed them up, but that beef was fairly rancid and probably full of synthetic hormones and steroids making for grander spectacle, but with an unhealthy dose of cognitive dysfunction. The biggest problem being the AI. If you are to siege a castle or town by yourself, it takes quite some time. You will spend several minutes building up a siege camp, then, if you want to win, a bunch of trebuchets and maybe a battering ram for good measure. However, if you are part of a faction, which I was, your faction will immediately send over an army to join the siege, but as a result, they will take command over it. They will then undo all your time spent on building your siege engines to either immediately attack without battering down the enemy's defenses, resulting in a loss almost every time, or they will just not attack period and sometimes just leave. It's infuriating, because if you attack a town without knocking out the defenses first, their siege engines will just obliterate everything you have. One catapult will take out like half a dozen to a dozen of your guys each attack. Your siege towers or battering rams won't even make it to the wall. It's super lame and people have been complaining about your allied AI taking over the siege for years now. I have found threads going back to 2020 regarding this issue, yet it's still here. So as a workaround, I will siege one town that I have no interest in, and when the inevitable douchebag from my faction comes, I'll switch to the town I actually want to take and pray that another army won't join. Just bleh. Also, if you're a moron like me, it can be confusing on how sieges actually work on the world map. So here's a little tutorial to show you the optimal way to invoke a siege. You start by building your camp, then you have all four range slots build trebuchets, the strongest of the bunch. But pay attention, for each trebuchet that finishes, you want to click on them and put them in reserve. Once all four are done, then place them all on the field at the same time while building a battering ram if you want. They will make quick work of all the catapults as well as the walls. Then, once all the walls are down and the enemy has no more siege engines, lead the assault to have access into the castle slash town. Took me way too long to figure this out, because again, I'm a moron, me. Furthermore, the AI and the siege assaults themselves aren't the best either when leaving command to your captains, and will often wander around without actually assaulting anything at times, just getting lit up by arrows, or they'll have one guy try to prop up a siege ladder while everyone stands back. It's fairly janky and only is remedied by taking command yourself and ordering everyone to charge and whatnot. This, however, like many things in Blanger Blords, is inconsistent. Sometimes the AI works just fine. I don't know what's going on there. Lastly, you will undoubtedly run into the occasional bug during sieges. This is pretty much the only place I've encountered bugs, thankfully, and there are a few and far between, but they're there nonetheless. Another big change we see from Warband is the new clan system. This is pretty fun and allows a dynastic sort of element where some characters die from old age and whatnot. 
My main character hasn't died yet, so not even sure if that's possible, but I have seen NPCs from other clans pass away. You can also build a nice big family. I got married to this lovely lass of the Southern Empire, and we already have like 90 kids. As the kids in your clan grow, not just yours, but your nephews and nieces as well, you get the opportunity to invest in the skills that makes up their baseline, leading to possible outcomes down the road, such as making them powerful stewards to govern your fiefs, mighty leaders that build gigantic armies, or just badass warriors in your companion pool if you want. It's a pretty neat system that I can't see much downsides to, so overall I really enjoy its implementation. So yeah, fun stuff, break down with the pudding pop. A major criticism I see from Steam users is that Blander Blood lacks a competent mid to late game. I find this somewhat baffling as that has always been up to the player when it comes to the Mountain Blade series. This is, at its heart, a sandboxy game. Like Kenshi, you're mostly meant to build your own story and that means the mid to late game generally involves you making your own journey. I would consider myself in the late game and I find myself having just as much fun as when I first started. I tend to really enjoy war. I love it whenever that icon pops up saying some kingdom had the audacity to declare war on my beloved southern empire. So whenever that happens, my mouth starts watering at the fountain of wealth that's about to come my way as I pillage and sack entire cities and make it a point to defeat armies that have double or sometimes triple my numbers. It's a blast. That's my story that I wrote in Blimey Boogs. I'm a charismatic and well-liked warhawk that is renowned across Calradia for being virtually undefeatable in tournaments and battles. I always let any defeated lords go instead of imprisoning them so my reputation and charm skyrockets and gives me great relations with all the lords as well as their clans. But if you don't have that sandboxy mindset, then I guess I can understand why you might be disappointed in the game's mid to late game. Because it gets to a point where doing quests is somewhat pointless because they're more a waste of time than anything, unless you're just trying to improve relations with the quest giver. But I would say that's not a fault of the game. Like I said, it gives you the tools, it's just up to you how to use them. Okay, there's still more I could go over here. I didn't really dive deeply into tournaments, companions, caravan and party creation, and mods among other things. But this video is far longer than I expected, just like my playtime with Mountain Blade Bannerlord. So in conclusion, I think Bannerlord is a fine prequel sequel to The Great Warband. It scratched that warband itch no problem. Does it have its issues? Absolutely. Smithing is a joke in my opinion. Sieges are super buggy and janky. Directional combat can be inconsistent. The modding community is disgruntled because each update breaks all the mods. For some reason, the game wouldn't save my menu options for the first like 100 hours, so I'd have to redo my options every time I loaded up the game. I did have issues with lots of crashes early on, which apparently I was only able to fix by disabling subsurface scattering in the performance options, and there's other minor annoyances as well. But all that said, the game is very engaging, fun, and most importantly, entertaining. I never felt bored while playing, outside of smithing anyways, but even then, there's always something else to do, so for every boring or bad component, there's two or three that are fun. And there is a plethora of replayability here. Given the limited amount of skills you can level each run, never being able to max them all out, it's encouraged to do multiple playthroughs for a different experience. This run I did a polearm focused, diplomatic, beloved cavalry guy that tends to get along with everyone. Next round I'm thinking I'll do a merciless archer rogue bandit type that doesn't use any cavalry and just goes around raiding villages and caravans. Tons of options. So there you have it my fellow patient gamers, Mountain Blade Bannerlord. A delightful treat that, although having some confusing design choices, is still ultimately a worthwhile pick in the year 2024. And like I do in all my reviews, here's a taste of the game's excellent soundtrack. Done over two discs, with the first disc being composed by Periscope Studios, and the second being composed by Ensemble Galatia. This particular track is called Call of the Steps. Enjoy! Thanks for watching, be sure to like, share, and subscribe, and hit that notification bell for future videos. This has been Jarek Defiler, God King of Calradia. You all have a good morning, afternoon, evening, or night, depending on where you are. And go play some Blanderdorks.